Am I unmuted? Uh, no, we can't hear you. You can hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, but yeah, things are coming to a close and they're coming to close in a way that things are connecting up nicely, I think. Um, let's get into it so we have some time to talk afterwards. So the things that you put into the chat, um, uh, and thank you, Tony, right? It's good, right? Tony, well done. Um, things that you put into the chat are subject to our scrutiny and engagement, so we hope that you put stuff in the chat. Some of you are in the habit of never opening the chat. I don't know why. Right? Why would people not open the chat? You guys know this is a graded exercise, right? You know about grades, right? Okay. So, uh, yeah, put your takeaway in the chat targeted question. So far, Tony is, is the one who's posing the challenge for me to, during the lecture. How do we explore more meaningful philosophical ideas, look at them from a higher perspective, understand the theory of construction, and create buildings with their own culture? Uh, wow, Tony. Uh, give me a break here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's more come out from my uh, job experience because I do see a lot of clients in, in China that kind of like wanted to have some sort of facade or some sort of exterior so looks like a Western uh, culture style while in, in Wait, Germany still so not in a way Checking, doing that. the systems check yeah. hold on we have no sound I guess that's not going to work, is it? <coughs> okay, say that, say that again, Tony. So I think more I come, came out of it, it's, it's about like, especially I, I kind of got that from when I'm doing a co-op uh, in China because I, I, I do see I met some clients and they're like try to oppose some sort of only on the exterior facade, where then to have us to explore new ways that we learn from our college, like new idea of, uh, of uh, architectural. Other than that, they kind of want to just have, I just want to have a sort of facade looks like a Western style, something like that, and just make Western building. I say, that's, I, I don't think that's how it works because our new way to explore building, we, it's in Western style, it's more of beyond combined culture together. And, and that's how I some sort of got that uh, sense saying, maybe we should try to change a little bit the perspective, try to persuade our clients into, you know, new way of how to get into the building uh, and, and everything. Yeah, well, well put. And it's a challenge uh, to work with clients who don't share our values uh, or don't, don't see it as an opportunity to do something that actually spreads the maximum benefits to the most number of people, um, which is what we know from all of this research that we're doing. Um, we know architecture does that. So now that we know architecture does that, we kind of have to do it. You can't not do it. Friends don't let friends miss the opportunity to spread the greatest benefits to the most people. So I, there we go. We got some more. So um, let's try to see what we can do here. The first step is to take a look back at uh, what we're doing in terms of the history. How do we look at history? Let's see. Before we do that, I'm going to get in the right place in the slideshow. 
what? There's 187 slides in this slideshow. There's no way we're going to get through that many. It's ridiculous. symbol means. Thank you. Okay. We got lots of topics here. We got some unfamiliar words. Zomia, Suba, Kraton. What do those words mean? Well, first let's look at history theory criticism. So you guys had two semesters of history theory. Now, uh, I'm confessing that it wasn't just history theory. It was history and theory that was informed by a critical attitude towards contemporary, the, the world we live in. And it's especially critical of the world we are moving into as you graduate into your careers. You've heard me say it a dozen times now. Uh, our look at history, the theories that guide uh, our look at history are informed by a very critical attitude towards the present and anticipating the challenges of the future. So specifically, given the challenges of the Anthropocene, your career space, what alternatives to the global nation state extractive capitalism, wow, that's a big word, Global nation state extractive capitalism. That's the system you're inheriting from us. Sorry about that. Um, what alternatives to that system offer more favorable outcomes? And one of the ideas embedded in this content, in this look at history, is you don't actually have to find an alternative to that. You don't have to burn down the nation state. You can actually. Uh, resurface those forces that are already acting in the world today. The hypothesis of this presentation is that indigenous knowledges uh, did not go away. They are still there. They are still here. We still have access to indigenous knowledges. Those indigenous knowledges, it's like diversity. If we're all thinking exactly the same way, if we are all, if the only people at the table allowed to speak are old white men of privilege, then you're not going to solve the problem. You're just going to keep doing the same thing and get making it worse and worse and worse. What we know now in the 21st century is you need to open up the dialogue to many, many more voices. You need to hear from diverse perspectives. Indigenous knowledges is a is one of those diverse perspectives. It's a whole category of diverse perspectives. It is all the other diverse perspectives. So in the old version of this course, we would start the first lecture like this. Four and a half billion years ago, the Big Bang. 200,000 years ago, humans, uh, the, as we understand, modern humans emerged and they spread across the planet. Are you falling asleep yet? Right? This is how we would do it. Uh, religions emerged and we would study the Fertile Crescent. We'd look at the first architectures, Chatel Huyuk, we all did that. And then we looked at this, right? Remember? We don't have to do it again. So do we care? Why do we care about Chatel Huyuk? Bahar, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Jatal or yo. Did I say it right? Yeah. Okay. Let's hear you say it. That's how it's spelled. 
Chatal. Chatal Huyuk. Chatal Huyuk. Okay. I have to check. Um, why do we care about Chatal Huyuk? Well, we care from this new, we used to care, and this is would get me, I hang out with these historians. We go traveling around the world and we spend weeks together. And I've learned to not share these, these thoughts with them because they believe very firmly that no, history for its own sake, that's what we do. You, know, you teach history and we have an ethical obligation to teach history unaltered, unsullied by perspectives of contemporary conditions. But I believe that because of the what we know about history, the relationship between history and theory, and the relationship between history, theory, and criticism, that that is folly. That it's actually impossible to look at history without looking at today. And that every generation revisits the historical record, makes its own interpretation of that historical record, and harvests lessons from those histories that are relevant to contemporary issues. So. Uh, in the old way, we would just look at Chatal, Chatal Huyuk uh, and say it's important for everybody to understand this because it happened. But the working hypothesis of this course is we don't care about anything that doesn't help us in our careers and facing these challenges of the Anthropocene. And since the challenges have uh, risen in urgency, to emergency proportions, we cannot afford to just look at this uh, for the sake of esoteric knowledge. Save that for your beach reading. We've, we're professionals and we've got work to do. The world is expecting us to show up with answers. Does this help us answer questions? Well, it kind of is interesting because it's uh, from a George Costanza perspective, it is the opposite of everything that we do. The public space is not the space between the buildings. The public's, there's only dirt between the buildings. The public space is the rooftops. There is no street other than the rooftops. Uh, it's interesting in that every house was not just a house, it was also a place of worship. It was also, uh, they're, they're the, only, the only building typology was house, according to the archeologists. But as in many uh, early urban civilizations, settlements and societies, uh, the houses took on other functions. It wasn't just for, for living. It was also for religious practices. Um, so a house would become a temple. And we would identify that because it has uh, extra uh, elements of veneration, extra painting, extra sculptors, these oxen on the wall. Yeah. Was that the info, the graphic of um, the, uh, two ago, I think, two before that? The one, there's dead people underneath. Is that insinuating that was also a graveyard? Yeah. Okay. We, we buried our people, and I'm saying we again. I'm trying to take the perspective of the residents of Jata Ryu. We buried our, our ancestors in the house. Um, and thus the sacred meaning of different areas of the house. And so we look at all this and we're trying to figure out what's going on. There was worship of um, various animals. These are the towers. Uh, when we die, we, we, our bodies are put on these towers, the birds, uh, devour parts of the body and then we bury the rest of it under the house. Interesting, does it help us? I don't think this is a good model for moving forward. Um, but we can start to look at the forces and here's interesting, this is an environmental landscape, water system, uh, way of informing the way we make our settlements and the way language develops. So we can learn things about the interplay between the landscape and the city, especially when it comes to water. So that's interesting, uh, but we don't really care about the gates, you know, the, the, uh, the gods, the gates of 
of Babylon that ended up in the German Museum. That's interesting because that's a contested uh, heritage that the colonizers stole from Iraq and uh, put it in their museum. And Iraq wants it back. Uh, in the meantime, Saddam Hussein rebuilt uh, much of the city of Ur in Babylon, um, and a lot of it has been lost uh, to the Taliban. Um, uh, we've got to keep moving. We're looking for lessons here. We're trying to harvest things that are useful for us. Uh, as recently as 20 years ago, we didn't really know about the Indus River Valley civilization. We didn't know about Mohenjo Daro, but uh, we dug it up. Uh, we found out that this is its arrangement and that um, the city of Mohenjo Daro was very much a place of, uh, that was built around the importance of water. Do we care about water in the 21st century? We don't? Well, you're supposed to, but it seems like they is not that much care for it. Yes, we do. We do care about water? Yeah. Do we care about water now? How much do we care about water now compared to how much we care about water 10 and 20 years from now? The reason why I feel like we like water is different. Or why we go to water. use water. Wasn't it like our, our the reserves are like drying up? Yeah, what's the thing about water? If you read the news, they tell us that water will be the new oil. That we won't care about oil pretty soon. Oil schmoil, uh, I think, is the uh, the mantra of your generation. Right? We don't care about oil, but we will destroy you over your water rights. Water, unlike oil, is the new shortage. Is the new resource warfare. Is the new trigger is the new global trigger for warfare. So we care about water. And so we now look back at history. There are an entire history courses, history of architecture courses, where the only thing we care about are examples of architecture throughout history informed by water. And some of my colleagues are teaching these versions of the history of architecture. It's all about water from beginning to end. It's a reasonable thing. So let's look at water. Uh, and there's, so there are some societies that we can look at in the history of architecture, even going way back to the first uh, weeks of the course you took in sophomore year, History Theory 1, that uh, can tell us a thing or two about water. Here's Angkor Wat. And when we studied Angkor Wat back in the day, I don't remember did you guys study Angkor Wat in Cambodia? Ring a bell? It was probably had nothing to do with water, but the new way we study Angkor Wat, it's all about water. The reason Angkor Wat exists, uh, it's a water temple, but it's kind of, um, we, it's kind of myopic of us. It's kind of short-sighted and narrow-minded of us to constantly, old things, it's all about religion. Yeah, religion was there, but religion was an organizing principle. Religion, to put it in terms of this course, religion was an operating system. Religion produced the outline, because we studied complexity in Islamic cities and, and Islamic architecture, we now understand that there is a dynamic interplay between a set of rules of an operating system and its architecture. And it goes back and forth both ways. That the operating system is what it is because the architecture has opened up new possibilities. And so the operating system, this is the lens that we look back at history through because it's gonna be useful to us in our careers uh, we look at history through the lens of how architecture produces and makes possible an operating system that can change everything. So here we have a cultural landscape of Angkor Wat, driven by the operating system of the worship of these gods, the story of the milky ocean 
that is churned by the, the God uh, in order to steal the elixir of everlasting life. Notice it's all about the water. And here's the snake celebrated that does all the stirring and the gods get tricked and the humans trick them and trick the gods out of the water. And so that's the basis for Angkor Wat. These are some notes by my colleague at MIT, Mark Yarzenbeck, who uh, has done a lot of re this research that I'm showing today. That's um, a reinterpretation of Angkor Wat through the lens of the operating system of irrigation, uh, plentiful harvests, and water, informed by and uh, disciplined by the religious system that keeps everybody uh, pulling in the same direction towards the management of this very scar scarce mon uh, resource of water. And so there's this complex interplay between Mount Meru uh, in the Hindu mythology, Hindu Buddhist mythology, the Mount Meru has, when you're gonna build uh, an architecture, you have to have Mount Meru and you have to have an ocean. And then you, you place the human settlements between the mountain and the ocean and the purpose of the cultural landscape of the human settlement is to manage the spiritual and physical uh, forces that allow human civilizations to thrive. And so it's all about the water. And so it's a temple, it's religious, yes, but it's also all about the water. So I'm going very quickly through all this. Here's the temple. We used to just look at the temple, but now we, we, we alter our view and recognize that the temple, even the temple, it's all about the water. And so, we dig and we dig and we dig, and we try to figure out what was the relationship between the water and the religious system and the architecture? How did the architecture play a role in the operating system that allowed this incredible uh, construction that is Angkor Wat? And why was it abandoned? What happened to cause the abandonment of Angkor Wat, where the jungle swallowed it up, only to be discovered by the colonial archaeologists centuries later? Uh, and so we don't know, because there's no one around anymore who has inherited these, these practices of water management. And so we're stuck. The archaeologists are totally stuck. They're asking the question, what role did religion play, play, sorry, typo, in managing scarce common resource sharing? Why do we care about uh, managing scarce common resource sharing? It's the thing, right? We don't have to say it again, it's the thing. The thing that you guys have to deal with, planetary death, the extinction of the human species. You gotta deal with the thing, so, you're curious, what about this managing scarce common resource sharing? Well, we're told that the secret to managing common resources that are shared is complex adaptive systems. So now we're back in the complexity topic. So um, before we go on with that question of how does architecture, how can we understand examples in history of architecture that helps us uh, achieve and maintain complex adaptive systems capable of uh, weaving between all the emergencies, all the crises, and make it to the other side of the century intact with some, some basis, uh, some resemblance of our former society still intact or hopefully a better version of our society in fact. So let's talk about Zomia. Zomia is a geography, and it's a geography of uh, avoiding domination. As, uh, and it's not, we're not just gonna be critical of European colonialism anymore. Europeans don't have a monopoly on oppression throughout history. 
the rice cultivating cultures uh, that came out of China, went to Korea, Japan, swept through India, Southeast Asia, all of these rice growing cultures, in order to achieve what they achieved, they had to set up an operating system that required people to stop living independently in their hunting gathering mode in quaint little villages scattered across uh, the country landscape. They had to move into towns that su could support the operating system of rice cultivation. And so it wasn't European colonialism, it wasn't just European colonialism, it was other operating systems that oppressed people. Um, and so Zomia is the study of the peoples who fled the rice cultivating uh, efforts uh, of societies in the irrigated lands uh, of the low-lying parts of Asia. And they ran off and moved everything, moved their families up into the hills where they could hide. Basically, they went into hiding. And we see it, another Zomia-like phenomena in the Amazon, uh, where indigenous peoples escaped the colonizing uh, forces of Brazil, Colombia, and the other countries who are logging the Amazon. And so they, they run away. They run away from the missionaries. They try to hide from all of these oppressive forces. And just they just want to be left alone. So they head for the hills, they head for the forests, they head for the jungles. In Southeast Asia, uh, the, the colonizers, uh, whether it was the Dutch, the French, the English, uh, the Germans, the colonizers, the missionaries, they came in and they wanted to save these poor primitive people. And the first thing they wanted to save, like, like the Spaniards and the Portuguese did in America, in the Americas, they wanted to save their souls by converting them to Christianity. And if they refused to be converted to Christianity, they took pity on their souls and ended their lives. You know, just kill them. If they're not going to be Christian, we're going to kill them. And if you are a Christian, we're not allowed, the Pope says you don't enslave Christians, so we're not going to enslave you. We're going to uh, put you into the encomienda system of labor. So it's not, technically it's not slavery, so don't worry about it. Um, but it is extractive capitalism. Um, that was an earlier version that started with Columbus in the 16th century. Then the Dutch and the English had their own corporate, uh, international corporation uh, uh, episode where they dominated uh, the French and, uh, and, and the French as well. And they, they went through this uh, area and they converted everyone they could and they wanted to save them uh, from uh, sin and they wanted to save them from diseases. And one of the key things on both levels uh, is the house. These longhouses where multiple families would live in a single structure, it was basically co-housing. It was, it was communal living. It was uh, part of their social life. It was an essential physical and social structure at the basis of their society. But we all know in the Christian church, you can't have families living under the same roof. All kinds of things go on between couples at night. You can't have the children there. You can't have neighbors sleeping with neighbors, right? So there was this bizarre morality. They had to get rid of the longhouses. Plus, all of this bamboo and thatch, that's the source of insect and rodent infestation. We got to get rid of this bamboo and thatch. So uh, we got to convert the bamboo and thatch uh, way of building buildings and replace it with wood. The problem is uh, the bamboo and thatch uh, system of construction was easy to build. Uh, as we grow up in these societies, we are taught to gather the grasses, bundle them in a certain specific way. We know which grasses to gather and which grasses to leave growing. 
We know how to bundle them. We know how to drape them over bamboo poles. We know how to make thatching. So we grow up knowing how to do that. And uh, when we get a little older, uh, they give us a knife. Our parents give us knives. And we learn how to make joints. And we can uh, make uh, bamboo connections. We can create structures. We know how to build buildings by the time we're teenagers. And so when uh, a young couple gets married, we throw a party. And instead of bringing Tupperware and coffee grinders and uh, food processors and those fancy blenders, what are they called, Vitamix blenders? Instead of bringing a blender to the wedding, we bring uh, a bean. We bring rafters. We bring a, seg a segment of thatching. So everybody shows up. And part of the wedding party is we build a house for them. Or we build, we extend the longhouse so that they have a place to stay. What could be more fun, I ask. Right? That's a fun wedding. You know, it's, it takes several days. And the family of the bride and groom provide the food. And we have a, a blast. And we produce housing. We don't need a 30-year mortgage. We don't need a a 5, 10, or 20% down payment. We don't need inherited wealth. We just need a village. That's pretty cool. That's a solution to housing affordability, if we could do something similar to that. Yes? Wouldn't that also be beneficial for as population increase? It would become easier and faster to build homes because you'd have more people. Yeah. The more people you have, the more labor you have to build a home. So villages that have uh, 80 people are wealthier than villages that have 40 people because they have more access to resource. And the basis of wealth in these societies was people. It wasn't land. They didn't own any land. They, sh they owned land collectively. They had access to the resources of the landscape around the village uh, up until the point where it comes in contact with other villages. When the missionaries came through and they said, no more bamboo, no more thatch, it destroyed the Sambatan cooperative gift economy where we give each other housing. And all of a sudden, we had to uh, get these big pieces of wood. Sometimes the big pieces of wood grow in the landscape around the village, but that gets depleted pretty quickly so you got to go further and further away to get the wood to build the buildings. And I don't know how to do these fancy joints. It takes special saws and special skills. All of a sudden, you have specialization. We can't have our 13-year-old girls building us houses anymore. Now you need 30-year-old men who are specialized, and you got to pay them. They're not from our village. you got to pay them cash money. Where do you get the cash money? Now we have to grow enough rice and other things to sell somewhere down the river uh, so that we have enough money to pay for housing. And the logical outcome of all this is uh, the crisis that you're facing when you graduate. You gotta pay for student loans and find housing in a very expensive market and a job to pay for those two things. And have you seen how much houses cost? We did that, right? So how did we get here? And is there any alternative? I don't know, maybe history can guide us. Um, when, Henri, uh, when Heinrich Berlage, Berlage, the famous architect from Amsterdam, visited the Dutch colonies in the 1930s, he said, wow, we're witnessing the last moments of this incredible culture. Look at this architecture. Look at this amazing uh, stone and brick gateway. Look at the incredible presence of handmade, uh, handcrafted landscapes uh, on this amazing island of Bali. We will never see this again because the Dutch colonial forces have swept through. They're eliminating, at this point in the 1930s, they're eliminating the ability to make this architecture 
and they're making everything based on a cash system. And so he's lamenting, even as he's making these brilliant sketches of the Balinese landscape, he's lamenting that the fact that he's going to be the last European to see it. So he goes back to Europe, he presents the sketches, and with this tale of he was witness to the last moments of Balinese culture. This is it's presaging. This should come later. Forget you saw this. Okay. And uh, when we look back in history in the 20th century and we look at these building types throughout Southeast Asia, we say, why are, do the buildings look the way they look? We say, oh, they had to look that way because of climate. It's hot, it's humid, it rains a lot. The buildings have to look this way because of climate. And so the technological, the building technology explanation of architecture uh, dominated throughout the 20th century. But then I say, what about this slide, where you put all of them together? All of these building traditions emerged in exactly, or more or less, the exact same climate. The exact same set of resources. Some are on stilts, some are on the ground. And they seem to go to great measures to differentiate, to uh, make themselves different from everybody around them. So it's not, uh, I'm going to say, it's not determined by climate. The building technology, these forms are not determined by climate. Uh, each of these villages has a slightly different language. Each of these villages has a slightly different interpretation of their religious systems. And each of these villages dresses slightly differently. And each of these villages builds their houses slightly differently. And my theory is that instead of responding to identical forces, they are actually struggling to differentiate themselves from everybody around them. This is a zonia. Differentiation is a strategy of surviving against oppression. They don't want their, their cultures, they don't want their identity to be erased. They don't want to disappear into the mixing bowl, the melting pot of the dominant cultures they want to preserve their own identity. That's why there are uh, 400 distinct languages in the country of Indonesia. They speak 400 different languages and they defend the differentiation of those languages fiercely. They're not going to uh, adopt the words of their neighboring village in the next valley they're actually going to learn their language, but they're going to keep the languages distinct. So they're going to learn four or five languages just growing up in the valley they're in, and they're going to be able to talk to the other villages to the north, south, east, and west, but they're going to retain their identity through their language, their dress, and their architecture. And uh, this bamboo and thatch architecture takes advantage of the fact that the bamboo bends and the tectonic realities of the bamboo become part of uh, what they exploit uh, to create these distinct expressive architectures. And the bending of the bamboo is the crucial uh, feature. And I don't know if you remember the lecture in History Theory 2 about this topic of the bending as the Dutch architects tried to figure out how to make these curvy roofs, they, they, they made heavy timber things like this and then they cut out a curve. Whereas this is the actual tectonic reality uh, driving those forms. So here is a portrayal of the linguistic diversity of the Southeast Asian uh, archipelago that uh, they could have very long ago just converged and become one uh, language community. And since 1945, they have worked very hard to spread the language of trade throughout the region. Uh, 
we call it in Malay. Uh, it was the language of trade for centuries throughout Indian and South, the Indian Ocean and South China Sea. People speak it uh, in Madagascar, uh, off the coast of Africa, um, because it's the Indian Ocean tra language of trade. That was embraced as the national language of Indonesian. Everybody speaks Indonesian, but they also speak their own language, and they probably speak one or two or three of the languages of their nearest neighbors. And this is not 400 distinct languages. This is just the language groups. So even within these colored areas, there are further differentiation of languages, especially over here on the island of Papua, the greatest linguistic diversity in the world. And so Zomia is this geographic area that's been identified in 2002 where uh, these distinct peoples fled to the hills so they could escape being disappeared into the dominant culture. So that's why the subtitle of this section of the lecture is Zomia, the art of not being oppressed. It's retaining your identity. And so it resonates with what's happening today in Boston at Nubian Square where they said, stop calling us Dudley Square. We are taking control of our identity. We are now Nubian Square. Change the names of the bus lines. It's not the Dudley bus line anymore. It's the Nubian Square bus line now. So um, back to this idea of the, back to this question that we left. Um, the archaeologists are trying to figure out how religion can, uh, what was the operating system in Angkor Wat that helped them create such an effective, complex, adaptive system uh, that they were able to survive and thrive for centuries? And what happened that caused it to collapse, right? Who do we talk to? Are there any villages around Angkor Wat? Are there any villages in Cambodia? So they go hiking up the hills and they're trying to find the people in Zomia uh, down here in Cambodia. Uh, they go hiking around archeologists and their poor unsuspecting graduate students getting stung by mosquitoes and uh, hiking through the jungles, trying to find someone who has a water system that can give them a clue as to how Angkor Wat worked. No one. They look and they look and they look and they find no one. That brings us back to Bali. So uh, in Bali, there's a religious complex adaptive system called the Suba. And uh, we know about it uh, very superficially throughout the 20th century. We just know that there's this old-fashioned religious system. These poor primitive people, they build these stupid little shrines in every rice field. It's so cute. Let's have the tourists come and take pictures of it. So they have small shrines. Every place where the water flows from the irrigation canal into the rice field, they put one of these. So that's a separate rice field at the separate inlet channel to feed the water to this rice field you got to put one of these. And where those inlet channels meet at major junctures, you put bigger ones. And where the big canals meet even larger junctures, you put an entire temple complex. And way up at the top of the island, it's a very strange ecosystem where there's a volcano and a lake below the volcano. So the slopes of the volcano drain down to the lake. And that lake, Instead of all the different rivers kind of collecting uh, and meeting, uh, were, uh, coming together to reach the sea, it's, it's the opposite. The, the lake comes out down the slopes in multiple different channels. They all start back up the lake. Oh! So, um, I was hanging out there in a village uh, in Bali with typhoid, trying to recover. And 
I'm feeling better every day. And there's some other people hanging out as well that I run into. And they're part of this guy's uh, research team. And they tell me uh, about the SUBA. And they say uh, that we knew nothing. We really didn't understand the SUBAC until we broke it. So in the 1970s, uh, there was this thing called the Green Revolution. And it was kind of like a, a modern colonial project. It was kind of like the missionaries. We scientific experts in North America and Europe, we go out, you know, all of us with PhDs, we go out into the rest of the world and we're trying to save them. Right? So watch out if you're trying to save the world. We go out into the world and we say, oh, you cute little brown-skinned primitive people, you, you need science. You need genetic engineered rice strains. You need to, instead of having two rice harvests a year, you need three rice harvests a year. We will get rid of poverty and scarcity. You're welcome. Signed, your white saviors. Right? So that's what we did. Uh, we went out and uh, it worked very well all over the world. Uh, and it worked very well here in Bali. Uh, the first year it uh, resulted in a record harvest. The second year it was even a bigger harvest. Wow, we did it. Touchdown, mission accomplished. Year three, eh, mediocre results. Oh well, just a glitch. Year four, major pest infestation. Year five, famine. Year six, starvation and death. What happened? Science is everything. What was it? Science is ever changing. Science is ever changing. Science, uh, well, um, this guy who we don't get to see, Stephen Lansing um, from USC, he's an anthropologist. And he was doing his research in Bali when this happened. And he quickly switched gears. And he said, wow, what's going on here? First of all, what went wrong with science? Second of all, um, if science failed, why was the former system so successful? So, um, so what, si what happened with science is uh, science said, use these new rice strains, plant whenever you want, plant uh, and harvest whenever you want, and you will get three harvests a year. Congratulations, and by the way, you're welcome. Well. When they did that, uh, when, they, when they planted whenever they wanted and harvested whenever they wanted, uh, a few bugs uh, would, would be born, they would hatch, and they would eat the rice. And they would get stronger. And then the neighboring rice field, they would look around for a rice field that was just uh, getting ready to harvest, and they would move to that rice field, and they would eat some more and they'd get bigger, and they'd reproduce. And they'd find a third rice field, they'd move to that, eat some more, reproduce some more. Their numbers would grow and grow and grow. So there was nothing to prevent those pests from growing exponentially in population. And so they wiped out the rice harvest. So that's what went wrong with the science. Seems pretty simple. What prevented that from happening before the scientists showed up? They only had two rice harvests, and it was coordinated through their religious operating system. Every year, the temple priests meet together. Here they are. Uh, there's the temple uh, high up on the slopes of the volcano. Uh, here's the, the Lake Batur, where the water supply starts. They carved tunnels through the hills uh, to bring the water out of the lake into these systems. And they carved multiple tunnels to create multiple systems that cover South Central Bali. Uh, and then at every juncture, the priests get together. They say, how are we going to organize our sequence of irrigation, planting, and harvesting? And they negotiate it. They negotiated according to their religious principles of sharing. And they harvest 
the the uh, the farmers and the, and the villages cooperate, so they are planting at the same time, harvesting at the same time. Does that make sense? It's complex. So the rice is coming is coming up at the same time. It's kind of like the cicadas. The the rice is all coming, uh, becoming ready for harvest at the same time. The bugs are born. They eat their fill and they're full. Uh, and then the harvest, the rice is harvested, and the bugs die. They don't move from rice field to rice field because all the rice fields come at once, and it's gone. Two weekends ago, I was in Connecticut, and I went on a river. Have you ever seen this? It was a, the river was swarmed or with uh, monkfish. And there was like thousands of monkfish in this river. We looked down over this bridge, and the water was frothy with monkfish. And every once in a while, one would leap out of the water. They were frantically trying to escape the bluefish that are this big. And they were swimming under the monkfish, coming up and eating as many monkfish as they want. Yeah. Ugly. Ugly little buggers. Cute. So everyone I was with was saying, oh, the poor monkfish, it's a slaughter, right? And I said, what do you mean? There are thousands of monkfish, and there are about a dozen bluefish that are eating the thousand monkfish. How long is it going to take before the bluefish is happy? Basically, the monkfish are outsmarting the bluefish by swarming. They might lose, you know, a dozen or two dozen, how many, what's the multiplier? How many monkfish does it take to feed up a bluefish? Probably, you could probably Google that. Let's say it's three. So the bluefish are going to kill 36 of the monkfish. The other 964, check my math, of the monkfish are going to make it. So it's the same with the rice fields. The first uh, hatch of the pests are going to eat as much as they want, and they're going to stop eating. They're going to reproduce, but then when all the rice is harvested, the offspring are going to have nothing to eat. Problem solved. No one knew this. Even the, uh, minister, the minister of agriculture was a Balinese farmer. He grew up following the Subak system. And he rose up through the ranks. He got his PhD, went to college, he learned agro science, and he become the minister, became the minister of the director of agriculture uh, for the province of Bali. And he had no idea how the Subak system worked. He just did it. So this anthropologist and the team that I met when I was recovering from typhoid, they were trying to figure out. They were using computer models. They were collaborating with the computer science department at the University of Southern California to try to establish a model that would replicate the uh, behavior of the rice field performance under the SUBOT system so they could just try to understand it. So this is another example of the complexity. A few simple rules yields very complex outcomes. It, uh, so this is an example of complex adaptive systems based on very few rules. You can't really, and this is, this is a lesson that comes into the architecture studio. If this is the kind of problems we're solving in architecture, can you think about it a lot in your head, solve it, and then build a model of it, and you're done? No. You've got to make a model, break it, learn from breaking the model, make it again, break it again, learn from that, repeat. You are, if you're just staring off into space, if you're theorizing, if you're just thinking really hard, no matter how smart you are, no matter how brilliant you are, even if God herself is whispering in your ear, it may not help. The real way to solve these problems is to iterate, is to sketch it, model it, critique it, 
repeat. And it's only through that repetitive process that you start to get insights into the complexity, how complex adaptive systems work. Go ahead. But that this, so kind of a, what you spoke about earlier in the sense that when the colonizer showed up and said, we have this system of science that you can use to make more, to go more, to go crop whenever you want. And they, they didn't assume that the people that already here didn't already go through iterations of the best way to do it. Is that that's what you're saying? Well, the nature, that's a great question. The nature of 20th century science, the, the science that gave us the great acceleration of the 1950s and ever since the 1950s, uh, Lansing uh, and Cox point out in this book, Islands of Order, uh, that just came out, that modern science at its core is extremely simplistic. And I choose that word very carefully. It's not just simple, it is simplistic. It is linear mathematics. It is, if we can grow more rice, we can get more money and more food, right? It's that simple. And that's the degree of complexity that modern science is able to deal with. It starts from a mathematical formula, it starts from a theory, and then they just do it and it's, most of it boils down to do it more and you'll get more out of it, right? It's a pretty stupid uh, form mathematical formula, right? You could be a C student in math uh, and never go beyond the third grade and that's the math of extractive capitalism. Um, in order to get to the complexity of these systems, you can't just think about it. You can't just write a formula on the whiteboard and then build it. You can't just do a, a diagram. Sorry, architecture students. You can't just draw a diagram, build it, and expect it to be a useful solution. More often than not, you're just going to make things worse with your simplistic diagram. Do that. Do your start that way. Do your simplistic diagram, but hopefully it's not the night before the final review. Hopefully it's the first week of the semester. Do your simple diagram and test it and critique it and do something slightly better. Do that enough times. By the time you run out of time and you're presenting at the final review, there's still all kinds of problems with it. But it's basically a very sophisticated, complex system, adaptive system, that has been, because it's been through iteration after iteration after iteration. This is the essence of the reflexive design process. It's reflexive. It goes in cycles. You go around and around and around. It's not, I have a theory, I built it, you're welcome, like we did in the Corbusier 20th century. Um, so does, I feel like a professor in the past used the term like simplistic complex, um, where it's like it's simplistic, then simple, then complex, then complicated. Is that what it is? Oh, I like that. Yeah, I think was it was that Mark Carol Klopfer. Mark Klopfer. Mark Klopfer? Yeah, it, okay. was, it was in like a cross, technically. It's like uh -huh. you want your building to be simple, but not simplistic, and it can be complex, but not complicated. Right. Yeah. Complexity is good. Complicated is bad. Simplistic is bad. Simple is good. To do repeat that. <laughs> so it's like simplistic is bad, simple is good, complex is good, and then complex, uh, uh, complicated is bad. Right. So we're looking for, you know, go back to weak topics. We're looking for complexity. Complexity can emerge from extremely simple rules, uh, but the outcome is unpredictable, like the swarm, remember the starlings swarming and swirling over the skies of Rome? How do you design that? It's basically one rule. You could, you could program uh, a thousand drones uh, to follow the rule. If the drone, if, a, if any drone nearby moves in a way that makes them closer or farther from you, then adjust your path to follow them. That's one rule. That's one line of code. If you programmed 
a thousand drones with that one line of code, because of the time delay built into the hardware, you will, you will achieve that extreme complexity of that form making. Uh, all you need is a dragonfly to disrupt one drone, and even if nothing ever disrupts it again, those patterns will emerge out of that system. So that's a, a simple set of rules and a complex adaptive system that emerges out of it that you could never dream of in a million years. No matter how many diagrams you drew, you would have to build it and test it and critique it and then build it again. Repeat. That is a new way of practicing design that we learn from things like this. Okay, no time, no time, no time. Subak. Oh, we did the Subak. Okay. Now let's look at other things. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to compress this part of the lecture dramatically. I apologize. Um, the basic point of this one, this part of the lecture, has to do with um, complex religious operating systems. And uh, it overlaps with the way we used to teach history of architecture, where we study the forbidden city in China because it happened, not because it helps us. We study the, uh, the Vedic tradition. We study Islam because it happened, not because it helps us. We study Hindu uh, religion and its cities and its architecture because it happened, not because it helps us. Well, now we're going to look at all these things, not just because it's happened, not because it's interesting, not because we're obligated to become educated uh, citizens of the world in terms of knowing a lot of stuff. We don't need to know a lot of stuff. Anytime you need to know anything, you just look it up, right? So the pressure's off. I don't need to know any of this. I don't need to know about the Chinese city or its religious system that produced the Chinese city. I don't need to know about Islam, the rules that created the city of Islam, the architecture of Islam. I don't need to know about Hinduism and all of these things and those forces that created the temple complex and the architecture of Hinduism. I don't need to know any of this. Unless it helps us survive the 21st century, unless it helps us solve problems in the 21st century. So let's see. Yeah. Is this in this, under the same umbrella of uh, when you were talking about be okay with failure? Or like, like in the sense of like, well, it happened and because it didn't last as long as we would, as we, as we are here today, we don't, it doesn't matter to us. Is that basically the same sense of? Well, it actually lasted thousands and thousands of years right. where our radical experiment is started in 1950 or so and will be gone before the cent before it's a hundred before its hundredth birthday. Is this the same sense of well, we'll be talking we're relating a lot of this back to different units. Could we also say this is almost a sense of or a few slides back automobility? Automobility will uh, you know taking the perspective of your grandchildren, um, believe it or not, there was this thing that happened way a long time ago when your great, great, great grandparents grew up. There was this steel and glass and rubber thing called a car. It's like the bicycles today, only it was an enclosure. And you'll have to explain to your great grandchildren uh, this thing that was the car, because they won't know what it what it is. It it came up and it disappeared like that. And the landscapes that it produced are still all around us, just the way the Roman landscape is still with us today. The automobile landscape 
will still be with us in the year 2150. Where? How old will you be in 2150? No, you'll be 150. 150. Oh, wait. Oh, 2150. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, damn, dude. It's not easy, man. My birthday's a leap year. So is it also like, because you mentioned uh, about the vice, where it's like more vice, like you're more, or with the signs, they need to be more vice, and they said more vice would be the end all, be all solution. But then the swan came and ate the food. That would be the same sense of like, was with the auto, like, automobility, where it's like, you say, well, let's just add more roads, add more highways, more highways will make the traffic yeah. lessen, and then... Yeah, we're not, we're not good at unintended consequences. Yeah. We're not good at predicting what will happen when we do stuff. Thus, the brilliance of reflexive design. Never do anything for the first time. Do it in small increments, see what happens, adjust it so you're never doing anything for the first time it's always and you know when you actually bring it up to scale it's the 53rd time you've tried this you've worked out the kinks the swarm is working the complexity is in balance um it was just a quick question when you say we are you talking about us as like americans or us as the 21st century or us as i know it's like a low my we is very mobile okay Flies so around. in the one the, the we that you just used earlier about the automobility, was that in reference to us as Americans or us as uh, just people? When I said, um, what did I say? It's fine, I can't remember either. Like, when I say we used to go around in these glass and steel and rubber boxes, that's the we of your great-grandchildren. Yeah. That's the we of the year 2150. I probably won't be around. So, I'm, it's my professional architect design professional week. Yeah. Um, so there's an operating system that produced this architecture. The architecture was the key principle. The reason I show this, the key takeaway of this slide, is that this architecture is a model of the cosmos. The universe as conceived in Hindu Buddhism is built like this. It has islands and continents and oceans, and then beyond the final continent, which is the gate and the wall, there is a vast ocean that never ends. And so this is a model of the cosmos. It's, it's, uh, this is, we, we can use it to teach our children how the universe is structured. Is that, and, and for centuries, when Europeans look at these cities, they, they stopped there. Oh look, isn't that cute? These primitive old societies that are long gone used to uh, have their superstitions because they didn't have science and they didn't know, they were very primitive and they did not, they were not sophisticated like us. They built these models out of superstition, out of worship. But we don't say that anymore. What we say now is we understand that this was not just uh, a symbol. It was an instrument. They used the city. They used this architecture to create balance and restore balance between heaven and earth. Uh, and so if something was going wrong in one part of the, the realm uh, that corresponded with this piece, let's say there was a famine, they would come to the part of the palace complex associated with that region and they would perform spiritual offerings and they would correct the balance between heaven and earth. Uh, but they wouldn't just do that symbolically they would also do something administratively. They would send people out. Uh, they would do this and they would do something else. We don't really understand it so well because uh, these people are all dead and gone. They do this. Just kidding. They're actually still doing this.
This is what I used to do this for every topic. Let's let's visit the island of Java. Here's the island of Java. What's that? Oh, that's the palace. It's awfully low resolution. So this is a mandala palace complex. Oh, nearby is the largest Buddhist temple in the world, Bodo Budur. It's a mandala temple. Uh, it was built around the year 800. Uh, the, the society, the Hindu Buddhist society that built this huge temple complex abandoned, they moved to uh, another place and the volcanoes right up here erupted and buried it in ash and uh, it was lost for quite a while. It's an amazing place. There's the volcanoes that erupted and buried this in ash. It still erupts now and then. Um, but we don't have time to go into that. Um, this is the modern capital of Indonesia on the island of Java called Jakarta. This is their Washington Monument. But it's not just a Washington Monument. It's also a symbol of Hindu, of this Hindu faith. Uh, it's the Linga and Yoni. Uh, the Linga is the tall thing and the Yoni is this thing. Um, the, in Hinduism, all creation comes from the joining of opposites, the female and the male. The male is the linga, and the female is the yoni. Got it? Okay. So the linga is the tall thing, the yoni is the base, and so we have the national symbol is grounded in the Hindu, Buddhist, Javanese religion, um, but Indonesia is more than just the Javanese, even though the Javanese are the dominant culture, uh, they're the largest by population and they tend to be the presidents and the administrators. It's also the largest Muslim society in the world, uh, the largest Muslim country in the world, 92% Muslim. Uh, it's the fourth largest country in the world uh, and they have a large number of uh, Protestant Christians, and there's a Catholic church somewhere, I can't remember where it is. But they also have, so they have all of these religions uh, mixed together in the architecture of the center of the country. We don't need to look at that. So when I graduated from, as you know from the reading, when I graduated from architecture school, I was working at IMP and uh, a recession hit and uh, fortunately I got a grant to go do research for three months uh, in Java and the reason I wanted to go to Java, I learned Italian, I was going to go to Rome uh, because I really was interested in courtyards and the, building, the architecture that create these courtyard spaces. But then a friend of mine uh, sent me this photo. And based on this photo, I switched gears, I learned Indonesian, and I applied for a grant. I got a three-month grant to go to this place I'd never been before. Um, and so I arrived, I spent the night inside that gate off to the right, and uh, I, it's so inexpensive to live there if you live in an informal settlement that I was able to stretch my grant to from three months to a year and a half. And by the time I got to the year and a half mark, I had figured out that there was a palace there and a royal family in it. Um, and there were three versions of this story. The first version is, yeah, there's this palace. It used to be important, but now it's a dead monument like Bodo Bador where there's no one, no one alive who has anything to do with the palace. So that was story number one. Uh, and the local university was about to transform it into a colonial Williamsburg living museum with actors pretending, you know, showing up, pretending they had never seen a camera or a cell phone before. And they would pretend they were the royal family 
and tourists would come through and they'd see the palace and they'd take pictures and then they'd leave. And that was the plan. So that's one portrayal of the situation in this city. And if that's the story you come away with, everything else is made invisible. But it, I, I found out that uh, these people I was talking to, the guy who was managing the palace, turns out he was a prince. And that he had 35 brothers and sisters who were princes and princesses. And his father was a king. And he had six wives. And there were a bunch of ceremonies that were based on the palace as a mandala representation of uh, the, the universe. And so it was based on the same uh, rings of mountains and oceans. And I hired a bunch of architecture students. We went through this whole part of the town. We measured everything and we drew it. So we produced this drawing and we figured out how the mandala, which is shaped like this, the model of the universe, was interpreted as the seven rings and courtyards and buildings and gateways, and then the two oceans beyond the final uh, ring. And so you can see the, the walls and the courtyards. And then an artist came in based, and we gave him all of our data and drawings, and he produced this amazing um, uh, aerial view from that um, that shows all of these uh, complex. And it turns out it's, a, it's an existing, um, that we do have access to the, to the living uh, descendants who are still performing these, they're, they're still performing these practices. This is, uh, the Javanese New Year where uh, they wait for the king to show up. The king shows up, uh, he's bringing sacred objects based on the predict what, what went wrong last year and what they predict is gonna go wrong next year. So they bring these objects out to try to restore the balance. People walk in from the surrounding countryside and throng to watch this parade. Um, of the white buff led by the white buffalo and the sacred white buffalo know when this parade is going to be and they just come and when the white buffalo stop the whole parade stops and when the white buffalo start running everybody picks up their skirt and runs along because we're all wearing skirts and it goes around the palace in this direction sometimes it lasts two hours sometimes it lasts six hours but you do it once a year to restore the balance of heaven and earth. Uh, and it's based on the pre-Hindu belief. Uh, it's a mixture of all of these different beliefs, including the mythology of the Queen of the South Sea, who has a special connection to the kings of Java. Uh, when the fire swept through and destroyed the palace, um, the government sent an engineer and said, it's just a bunch of buildings, let's rebuild it. Uh, trees are really expensive, let's rebuild it in concrete. And then uh, he talked to the royal family and he went from that first picture of, it's just an old, it's just a bunch of old buildings. You know, we need it for tourism, sure, but we don't care if it's built out of wood, we can build it out of concrete, it's cheaper. Um, but then he went from the first story to the second story. The second story, is where, no, it matters. There are still religious practices. It still plays a very important role. You see the, the, the wearing these Samir. That's the king um, putting a golden nail into the very sacred column uh, as part of the reconstruction. Uh, here's more rituals that are being, there's a, there's a canon in there that used to be a priest, but God transformed him into a canon. The only person who's allowed to see the canon is the priest who cleans the canon once a year and the king himself. When the water comes off the canon, this building and the surrounding building, they sweep the water off to the edge and people compete with each other to get the water because it's sacred water. And they put it in the rice field 
They put it in their kids' porridge, even though it's dirty. Um, but it's so sacred. Here's a Dutch carriage that is still sacred. Every Wednesday night, they put an offering out. And this Dutch carriage uh, has become a Javanese uh, thing. And so we're back to the syncretic, the idea of syncretism. Uh, when a new thing comes in, they don't collapse. Uh, they don't abandon the old things and embrace the new things. They adapt and adopt the new things and make it their own. So the brass band from Europe, the, the fez from, uh, from Anatolia and Ottoman, uh, the, the Dutch tuxedo coat, they snipped off the tails so the, the Javanese short sword wouldn't, uh, could be fit into their sarongs, etc. The Baroque architecture of the palace, uh, it's all made Javanese through the process of time. It's kind of like the Issei Shrine. Here's the Islamic celebration of the Prophet Muhammad's birth, Grebeg uh, Maulud, and uh, it's not just uh, Islamic, it's also Hindu, Javanese. There's the Linga and the Yoni, and it's also uh, veneration of the Queen of the South Seas. Here's another syncretic example, just like, uh, right? Yeah. The, this is not the same mosque, but it looks like it, right? It's basically taking the Hindu uh, roof forms that you still see in Bali, but they uh, use the roof. The most sacred Hindu form is the roof form that comes to a point, like a pyramid. And so Islam embraced that sacred architecture of Hinduism created, it has to be an odd number of roofs, so the Islam chose three. And so Islam embraced the Hindu uh, Javanese architectural form, made it the mosque, and now this mosque form spread throughout Southeast Asia as the Islamic form. Um, but So it's Islam, it's Hinduism, and it's Queen of the South Seas, these guys are grabbing at the offerings because they are sacred and will bring good fortune uh, when they bring these things home. When, uh, so I spent altogether four years there. We documented the entire complex and the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, which maybe you've heard of the Aga Khan Award. Um, it's an amazing uh, set of architectural projects um, that have been recognized um, by His Highness the Aga Khan through the award. They said, we want to have our award ceremony here in the palace. They contacted me and I said, sure, we can fix up the buildings, but we have to <clears throat> do it according to the spiritual practices. We have to do everything right. And sure, we want to be practical and make it a successful award ceremony, but there are spiritual, religious, uh, cultural reasons to repair this building, which uh, is the place where the king every year um, renews his commitment to the Queen of the South Seas. They go up to the, the top room, which no one's allowed to go in but the king, and uh, they reconnect, They're, they re, uh, they have sex, and it renews the connection between the mythical queen of the South Seas and the king. And so this is a very important structure. And so um, we performed all the right rituals, uh, and I worked with Pa Asmo, who is the carpenter, but he's also a priest. He's basically the royal... Uh, master builder, and he and I worked together to uh, renew the buildings, uh, performing all the right offerings, wearing the, the Samir, um, and then we had the Aga Khan Award for Architecture. There's His Highness uh, the Aga Khan, His Royal Highness the uh, 
the Sunan, the Sultan of Solo, the Minister of Culture, um, and that's me and that, when I was younger. And I was translating so that between the two of them, between English and Indonesian, I sure they could talk. Yes. How did you feel when in this setting? How did I feel? Yeah, like like like, like what well, I mean, like wearing the suit. But like, you know, I know like your dog was to like chant, like you said. But like, how did it feel being with them rather than being a part of the culture? Oh, um, most of the time I spent in this space, um, I was wearing the same clothes I'm wearing today, except it was warmer, so I so I would wear this shirt. So I was in flip-flops, so I could take them off, because no shoes, it's a no-shoe zone, right? But they're wearing shoes, right? So they make exceptions. But then I would attend these ceremonies that I was showing you. I would attend the religious ceremonies, and in those occasions, I'd wear the same clothes that the king's wear. This is the costume, although his batik is very special. I was not allowed to wear that batik. I would wear a batik like the minister of culture's batik. But so I spent, you know, every day I would go there, I'd be dressed like this, except once or twice a month, I would be dressed like this, with the thing, and the sword, and the Samir, and no shoes. Uh, and then for this one time, I had to go buy a suit. So I still have this suit, it still fits me. Um, uh, but I had to have someone make me a suit because I didn't have the clothes because I'm used to wearing this through all the things. So this is kind of where architecture sometimes take us. I was forced to, I was compelled to adapt to the situation uh, and play a different role each time. Earlier in the evening, I found that the toilet was not working, so I took out my Swiss Army knife and I got soaking wet. And I opened up the pipe and fixed the toilet. So, a design, a design career, a career in design can take you to unexpected places. So, last thing: rediscovering indigenous knowledges. So, the, the takeaway, the key takeaway of that, is the first story, uh, the dominant history, is that uh, the West has won. Extractive capitalism has erased, has uh, bulldozed all of human history, all cultures. Uh, we're going to see the languages disappear one after another, decade after decade. Uh, that we're all going to be speaking English uh, and getting our food from Amazon. That's our fate. Um, that's the, the cartoon version of extractive capitalism. But it's not the whole truth. We, and especially now that we realize that is a dead end, it's going to destroy the world, we now have a chance to look at other things. We need to take a systems approach. We looked at this, like Buckminster Fuller in his world game. We need to understand how everything is interconnected. We need to look at um, how uh, we need to use our fancy Revit and Rhino and computer things to model the architecture at multiple scales, including the planetary scale, and to test things out. We're doing, this is a design iteration. What if we do this? What is the outcome? Let's test it. Let's test it at multiple scales. Right? And so this is what architects are capable of doing with the tools of architecture uh, at every scale. You could do the same thing at the scale of a house. We already do this at the scale of the house. If we create uh, a louvered facade system, um, what will happen? You model it in Revit, you run it through your solar, uh, solar day, you take a videotape of it, you critique it and then you tweak it. You adjust it and uh, you change it. You do that at the scale of a facade, like you are this semester, I hope. You do it at the scale of the planet. You do it at every scale in between because that's what we can do 
This is an approach to architecture that has remarkable uh, potential. This is the kind of idea, this is what people do in the thesis program here. They so take, take an idea and they test it. Did a student create this? No. Oh, okay. But at one point, the people who created this were students. And they were architecture students working with computer scientists. And by the way, you have a whole very good program of computer science over there if you wanted to do this. How would we? Like, Grasshopper. Better students, right? Um. It's a short answer. Nothing. But you, in order to do grasshopper in an American society, you'd have to go to an institution that offers the lessons of grasshopper. Therefore, not even can test it. No, we don't, we don't teach you software. I'm sorry. Yeah, when have we ever been did you think software? we did you think we teach you software? I'm sorry, <laughs> we don't teach software. <laughs> if you want to learn software, go to some other school where they some go to some vocational training camp. Yeah, right? yeah. we don't teach you software. We yeah, would not staying insult up until you. three a.m. learning how to use InDesign. Exactly. The our friends don't let friends uh, not know software. Your friends are going to teach you software. That's I special wish you could. What? Specialization. Right? Where someone knows how to use it because they. Right. Okay. Isn't that pretty? Yeah. So um, let's just backpedal to bamboo, the thing that was erased and is now gone. And if their lives depended on it, Nobody in Southeast Asia would ever live in a bamboo house. Bamboo houses are for poor people who can't afford proper houses. We know that, we, us in Southeast Asia, we know that down to the fiber of our bones. Poor people are the only ones who live in bamboo houses. So give it up. Bamboo is gone. Where is it? Did you see this? Yes. Pretty cool, right? Sick. Did you see this house? Yeah. Did you see this series? Yeah. You saw it in the series? I, I just remember. No, no, no. Yeah. So I showed, I showed this house at the end of the arts and crafts lecture last summer. Remember that? Remember that? Just say yes. It makes me feel better. <laughs> we. We use that you're using that? This, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Why? Bamboo's dead. Why would you yeah, use that? bamboo? Super regenerative. So this guy I met in Bali, uh, he's trying to sequester one billion tons of carbon per year by promoting bamboo. This is him. Uh, promoting bamboo for clothing, for uh, what do we call mass timber? Instead of laminating wood, you laminate bamboo uh, and paper and lots and lots of other things. There's the T-shirt. There's the construction. Yeah. So with the topic of like bamboo, it's at least in the cultural setting, it's known as like the poor people's material. Right. So that's not evident in the United States, or at least in our country. Well, in the United States, bamboo is nice for cutting boards and maybe some floors, mm -hmm. but it's not approved for construction. Yeah, of course. Um, so, like, I guess if we don't view it as that, as a, a poor man's material, then why isn't it significantly more prominent over here? Because uh, this, not even just for sure. this is a great question. It brings us back to the simplistic uh, steel. We like steel because you can model it as a linear system. The thicker you make the steel, the stronger it gets. And it's not linear, but it's a very simple mathematics. Right? Uh, concrete, we love concrete. It's a little more complex because it only, concrete is only good for compression. So you've got to add some steel to it. And you gotta, apparently, you've got to connect the steel and the concrete, as we learned in Miami again. Steel and the concrete have to be connected, so they act together in compression and tension. Right? 
So we love concrete and steel. It, it's, it obeys very simple mathematical rules. We like spruce pine fir because we can put the uh, engineering values in a book that's very thin and put it on your bookshelf and you can look it up so you know, or you could look it up in your studio companion and see what your structural depth needs to be for that span and that live loading situation. We love those three materials. Anything that doesn't obey simple mathematical rules, we don't care for. We make them illegal. We put people in jail when they use them, and we tear down the buildings they build, and we prevent them from building things on campus because we're worried. Unless it can get an architect's stamp, a structural engineer's stamp, and be legally approved by the Boston Building Department, we won't let you build your bamboo structure. So we don't like bamboo because it's harder to build with from that approach. But, and yet we built incredible things with it, right? This is what it can do. Is this going to fall down? No, it's not going to fall down. Long before it falls down, it will tilt and will fix it. It's funny because like we make this, they make this argument of like bamboo not being like linear, but yeah. then you just see a concrete building demolish. Yeah. For no reason. It's just, it's just like a very like things can go wrong or... even when you're taking a really stupid, uh, simple yeah. approach. Things can go wrong. Okay. I can add it to what we were saying, Jack. Uh, could I do sociology? Right yeah. Now? yeah. And we were talking about like human behavior, societal behavior. And a lot of it really came from, which I see the correlation is when colonizers came over, that they had this already way of living. And so that's kind of how Billy Wobble was saying kind of transpires to this idea of like, well, if it doesn't help now or it advances us, then, you know, this thing is less. Well, how do they know that it won't help us? Or that was just based off of, well, I call it the three Gs, yeah. God, glow, God, gold, and glory. And that's kind of what oh, set God. Americans up. So colonizers from coming here, going west, manifest destiny. Mm -hmm. And so, like Robert was saying, if, you, if you're if you not with me, then I don't want you're you to part of my, yeah. yeah. Like, so we're, we're very good. Well, and we're, we're very, like uh, Alan, my professor was saying, we're very good at, we, we can't tell who's like us, but we're very good at saying what's not us. And we can definitely just think someone away from us, but we can't, we can't, uh, we can't realize how similar people are to us, because mm -hmm. like, like we were saying, like in the pictures, like they have like all these bamboo, these beautiful, they have beautiful structures, and people came over and said, you know what? Because it's not concrete, because it's not completely enclosed, and doesn't follow our our religion being God, then that's wrong. Okay, just saying. Yeah, and it's not just uh, the challenge is not just to recognize uh, our similarities. It's to, uh, very quickly after that, recognize the value of our differences mm -hmm. and not insist on similarity as a prerequisite to engaging people. Uh, like it, it will be useful for you to learn other languages so that you have access to other experiences. Um, the, the, this is, you know, the world is now a laboratory that can inform what we do in the design studio in ways that were never true before. Like, this stuff has been happening a while, but now it's on TV. Now it's on Apple TV. Uh, it's a new world. She, uh, Elora, came to Cambridge and she brought her team, and we went all we hung out. We we went to restaurants. We talked, and you know this. You know, and we go there, and like, I, you know, so we bring students there. Wentworth students go to the other side of the planet, it's 12,000 miles away, it's a 36 hour plane ride. We go there routinely for three years in a row, and we learn from each other. That's rare and precious. Oh, I was not looking at this. This is also, that doesn't kind of fall in line with the whole oh, this is cute uh, mentality. Mm -hmm. Just because a lot of stuff is now being recorded most so most mostly for like this idea like here there's other things happening in the world 
Mm-hmm. Is that kind of what's happening here too? You mean? Uh, like a lot of what, like you said, you went over, you had these experiences, so you can talk about it beyond this just, beyond this, oh, it's a cute thing that's happening. Mm-hmm. Whereas we have like TV shows and documentaries where they mostly push for this, uh, it's cute. And I was more curious, I guess the question would be like, uh, push for what? It's, it's it, cute. It's, it's cute. Okay. It's cute. It's, uh, oh, this thing happened that we should just talk about it because, oh, it's different. It's interesting. Uh, do you think like there needs to be less of that? More, like in the sense of, well, it might start with it's cute, but it quickly uh, grows into, huh, I, there's something going on here that is interesting. Maybe, uh, maybe I can use it in what I'm doing now. I feel like a good way to maybe look at it is like you can look at a graph and see how it works, but there's also a mathematical equation to that graph. You know, so there's like a deeper understanding, and like, but that gives it purpose. And you didn't know the purpose unless you researched it. Like it's or like it's cute. That's cute. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Maybe it's more than just cute. Maybe it's something that I can incorporate. I can emulate. Won't be exactly the same, but this idea of a closet that rotates in and out of different rooms. It's more than cute. Uh, you know, it's worth it's worth copying. What's that? The building itself is a musical instrument that has strings strung down the middle of this uh, shaft. And you can play the building. You can tune the building. That's cute. But is it more than cute? Yeah, it's more than cute. It's something you can, you can interpret and emulate and work with. And there's a bunch, it's not just one house. It's a whole bunch. It's a whole village. They've built over a hundred buildings like this. But then, like, I also think, like, what can that benefit? You know, it's also, like, after the fact as well. It's like, all right, now with this, like, development, what can, how can that help other things? It's like, it's like well, a never-ending time. Like well, that's that. when we get to, um, to this guy. When, when bamboo buildings become okay again. Uh, either by mass timber strategies or by making it an attractive way to live, uh, all of a sudden you're sequestering a billion tons of carbon a year. And you're creating a cultural landscape of bamboo villages that is harvesting bamboo from around the village. And you've just restored that thing that went away, we thought went away in the 1930s with colonialism. Suddenly people are surviving in villages and they're thriving in villages. They don't have to move to Jakarta. Or they don't have to move to Boston. They don't have to move to the big cities. And that's how you turn things around. So does it scale up from project to system to culture and back? Okay. So, what are you going to analyze for Monday? I think uh, buildings set in the. I recommend buildings set in the cultural landscape. And I love, I love this drawing because it shows buildings set in a cultural landscape where you see the system that connects the two. Or something else that, that brings that together. And what are you going to do for Friday night? Sleep. Other than sleep. Before you go to sleep. Why don't you pick three, three readings? Okay. Why don't you go to... Go to zero zero forum. 
put your name here and choose three readings. In proper bibliographic form. And do that by the time you get to Friday at 6. Sorry, it's an odd deadline, but it's so that uh, we can have class on Monday, and then on the Wednesday, next a week from today, we want you to have we want you to show up like every Wednesday. We want you to have, show up ready to give us a takeaway, one sentence takeaway, and one or more target question uh, from the thing you read past tense. You chose one of the three, uh, and you read it, and you for Wednesday morning by ten you show us a slide that has your takeaway sentence and your at least one target question. And we also want uh, that to be followed next Wednesday, a week from today, by three images. Here are three images that I was thinking, uh, one of these three images I was thinking I should analyze. Okay. Cool. Questions? Is that all somewhere? Uh, yes, it is. Um, let's look over here. It's uh, conveniently located in your local Brightspace. Have you seen it on your phone? Brightspace works really well on your phone. So I'm going to go to, I, I think, I don't know. I don't know where to find this, but let me guess. Where do you think it might be? Um, 09. Uh, no, it's in Project. Um, there's my analysis, and here's my submissions. Uh, number one, by Friday, July 30th, by 6 p.m., there's three or more potential readings in this. And it takes you right there, right? Just, it's got a live link. So that's the first thing I need to do, is by Friday at 6, I need to do that. Then by Wednesday at 10, I need to show up at class having done the reading, one sentence takeaway, and also you need to do the image selection. And then, uh, like, like always, you show up the following Monday having performed an analysis and made a video. Where's the assignment for that? The instructions are slightly different. The instructions for the analysis is right there, connected on a live link. Come on. Should be there. There it is. So it's the usual instructions for the analysis. Don't look at that. It's treating me like I'm a professor, not like a student, so it's uh, misbehaving. But here's the analysis assignment. It's slightly different. It looks very familiar, right? Choose an image, analyze it, compose a one-minute argument with the citation. Last thing you do is write the claim and the question. Compose a caption. Then write an action paragraph that comes after the analysis paragraph. Then once you know what your action you're heading for, you know what your analysis is, then you write your framing paragraph that introduces the whole thing. So the instructions are slightly different this week for this analysis assignment. But it's the same submission location. You name it the same thing. You upload your video to the same YouTube playlist, etc. Questions? So this one's worth big points. You did it when it was worth 30 points, uh, and you did that five times. And you did it some more, each time it's worth 60 points. How much is this one worth? 120 points. It's worth uh, the same as four of the ones you did at the beginning of the semester. Because now you're confident you know what you're doing, I hope.
you should know what you're doing at this point. If you don't, ask a friend. If you still don't get it, ask me. Make sure you're not in the analysis paragraph. It might be easier because in the framing paragraph, you can describe anything you want, right? But in the analysis paragraph, as always, we expect you to be translating what the visual evidence, the story the visual evidence itself is telling us to translate that into a text. This architectural feature, because it is doing this, it's producing this effect. It's bringing people together. Uh, it's doing certain things. What is the, what element of the architecture is performing what? purpose. That the structure of each sentence in that analysis paragraph wants to follow something like that structure. This architectural feature is producing this effect. Cool. Is it cool though? Is it? I'm just I think it's honest. very cool. Okay. Thank you everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.